Well, welcome again to Lidwin Community Church, and here we are with another devotional. And today is Storytelling Day, so I have my uh, my producer, my director, uh, Tim, sitting there. He's all excited because now he gets to listen to some stories today. But um, let's pray first, uh, dear Heavenly Father. We just uh, come to you today with some some stories, uh, some uplifting stories, some. Stories, Lord, about you and and about life. And so we just ask you to be with us as we we go through this life and through the ups and downs that all of us are having, uh, and and that we've had from from the beginning. So uh, it's nothing new. Uh, what's new is that uh, that gospel is starting to spread, even though there's many things going on in the world. Um, your word continues to spread, Lord, and we just thank you for that. And help us to be a part of that, uh, that evangelistic spreading, Lord, and and uh, and just help us to uh, to understand where we're at and to lay all our problems at your feet and trust in you. And so we ask you to bless this devotional and help us to enjoy our our mornings, our evenings, our afternoons, whenever we listen to this. We ask it in your name, Amen. All right, today. Uh, decided to tell three stories. Uh, one of them I looked up, one of them I read about, and the other one is uh, I lived through it. So we're going to start with the one I lived through. Uh, Heroes of the day. So I'm going to tell you, I, I, this is a rarity for me. I really never talk about some of the things that I did. And the reason I, I don't is uh, I grew up with my mom telling me, hey, you know, uh, pride comes before the fall, so I've never been one to boast. So I'm not really boasting when I say this, even though this was a pretty good event. Um, you'll get the point of my message on this individual story at the end of it. So I belong to one of the greatest American Legion baseball teams in San Pedro's history. Uh, we had great players on that team and some great people. and. Uh, We'd made it into the playoffs, and we were, I think, in the third game of the playoffs. We're playing at, at the legendary Blair Field, which is uh, a bigger than Dodger Stadium. I mean, the fences were back. There were 12-foot brick walls. So in order for anybody to hit a home run out of Blair Field, you probably need a gun and load it with a baseball. So, um, But it was a beautiful field. It was a beautiful stadium. And so we, we're getting to play the playoffs. and. Um, I hadn't been struggling with my hitting. I was hitting probably close to 350. I mean, I, I could hit, but you know what? It just wasn't uh, epic when I was hitting. And up to that point in my career, I'd always been a, a good home run hitter, and and uh, and I was a pitcher hitter. So, anyways, to make a long story short, here we are in the playoffs, and uh, my hitting coach, his name was Paul Zubek, and Paul was what you call a throwback in baseball. He was the guy, he, everywhere he went, he was in baseball clothes. He uh, came to practice. He had a big old chewing tobacco in, his, in the side of his mouth, and he, he talked like a big leaguer. He played pro baseball. He, what a wonderful guy, a wonderful man he was. As a young kid, he, he coached many teams, helped out many kids, um, but was just a, a very... Uh, Solid person, great morals, great family. I loved baseball. And so um, he came up to me uh, before this playoff game. And, you know, it's a single elimination. You lose, you're out. He came up to me before the playoff game. He says, hey, Lefty. He goes, do you mind if I make an adjustment in your, uh, in your stance and the way you swing the bat? And I said, coach, you're my coach, man. You, whatever you tell me to do, I'm just, I'll do it. No problem. So... He adjusted my, my batting stance, and it was a little awkward. I'd never taken a stance like this. It was just a little bit of an awkward stance. But 
But Paul, Paul knew what he was talking about. And so here we are in this big game, and I come up the first time, and, and uh, it, it, it was pretty strange for me to, to be swinging this way. And the guy throws a pitch, and I saw the ball so clear. At the first time in a long time, I saw the ball clearly because of the way I was standing. But I was not used to it, so I hit the ball. I hit a hard ground ball to the shortstop, and they threw me out. And, uh, but I felt really good because I, you know, I could almost read the name on the ball. It was, it was that, that incredible. And next time up, I get up and I hit, a, I hit a line drive off the left center field wall. And it was about two feet away from going over the fence for a home run. That so drove in a couple runs. And, and it was a back and forth game. It was, very, it was in a very exciting game. They were a very good team. I think it was West Torrance. And... Um, and I come up again a couple innings later, and God throws a pitch, and I kid you not, I'm in the zone. I can almost see the threads on the ball. And I hit this next pitch I hit, and it hit the very top of the rounded wall, went straight up in the air and came back in the park. And um, I drove in a couple more runs. And here we are in a, in a match going back and forth, and I already done Two things that I never thought I could do in my life, especially at that park. And then we come up to the last inning. There's two outs, and I'm coming to the bat with one guy on. And this pitcher had been throwing me fastballs all day, so now he's going to throw me curveballs. And I, I can't hit a curveball to save my life. So he throws me six curveballs, and I, fortunately I, I fouled him. I just kept fouling him off. And then he hung a curveball, which uh, a, probably a great hitter would have hit out, but I'm not a great hitter. I mean, I did hit it out, but it was foul. I pulled it foul. So now, because I hit the ball hard, he's going to throw me a fastball. He throws a fastball, and that pitch, beautiful. I could read the name on it. And I hit the ball, and uh, as I was rounding first base, the ball just took off, went over the left center field wall. So I, I had a walk-off home run to win the game. I'm rounding the bases, everybody's going crazy, all my teammates are going crazy, and I'm happy we won. And, um, you know, the, the locker room was loaded with uh, newspaper reporters and baseball scouts and, you know, talking to me. And, and uh, the only thing that was on my mind was, wow, man, we won, we get to play again next week. And I really didn't care about the rest of the stuff. But the one thing I, I got to say is, you know, uh, one of the, Newspaper guys came up and said, hey, man, you're a hero. And no one's, no one's ever really called me a hero at that time in my life. I think I was 16 or 17. No one ever called me a hero. I mean, I didn't do anything heroic. And I thought to myself, well, man, this, is this what it's like to be a hero? And then I realized, man, that's just part of the game. I had a home run. I, I had many home runs in my life, but that was, that was a special one. That was great, but... Why was I a hero? What, what did I do to become a hero? Win a baseball game? And I didn't really win it myself. Man, we had great pitching, great defense. But you know what? There was a hero that day. You know that, who that hero was? It was the guy that took no credit. So I'm about to give him all the credit. And I, I'm sure I mentioned it in the newspaper. But Paul Zubek was the hero. He was my teacher. He was the one that made the adjustment. And I could tell you right now, I, I could probably hit, get out of bed and hit a baseball. It, it, that's never been hard for me to do, but not the way I did that day and not the way that he showed me how to hit and showed me how to stand. He was the, he was the unsung hero, but he was the real hero. He's the one that gave me the advice. He taught me. All I did was listen to what he said. So in my opinion, Mr. Paul Zubek was a hero. He's a great coach, great person. And he gave out great advice. Now I'm going to read a story about another hero. And uh, I think you'll like this. And this is a true story, as that one was. Um, John Harper was born to a pair of solid Christian parents on May 29, 1872. He was on the last, it was on the last Sunday of March in 1886 when he was 13 years old that he received Jesus Christ as his Lord, as the Lord of his life. He never knew it and what it was to sow his wild oats. 
never had that opportunity. He began to preach about four years later at the ripe age of 17. Now he'd go down on the streets of the village pointing out, out his soul in, in earnest, pouring out his soul in earnest to entreat men and, uh, and women to be reconciled to God. 17 years old. As John Harper's life unfolded, one thing was apparent. He was consumed by the word of God. When asked by various ministers what his doctrine consisted of, he was known to reply, the word of God. After five or six years of toiling on street corners, preaching the gospel and working in the mill during the day, Harper was taken in by Reverend, Reverend E.A. Carter of Baptist Pioneer Mission in London, England. This set Harper free to devote his whole time and energy to the work so dear to his heart. Soon, John Harper started his own church on September of 1896. Now known as the Harper Memorial Church, this church which John Harper had started with just 25 members had grown to over 500 members. When he left 13 years later, during this time, he had gotten married but was shortly thereafter widowed. However, however brief the marriage, God did bless John Harper with a beautiful little girl named Nana. Ironically, John Harper almost drowned seven several times during his life. When he was two and a half years of age, he almost drowned when he fell into a well, but was resuscitated by his mother. At the age of 26, he was swept out to sea by a reverse current and barely survived. And at 32, he faced death on a leaking ship in the Mediterranean. Perhaps God used these experiences to prepare this servant for what he was to face next. It was the night of April 14th in 1912, the RMS Titanic sailed swiftly on the bitterly cold ocean waters, heading unknowingly into the pages of history. On board this luxurious ocean liner, there were many rich and famous people. At the time of the ship's launch, it was the world's largest man-made movable object. At 11.40 p.m. on that fateful night, an iceberg scraped the ship's starboard side, showering the decks with ice and ripping open six watertight compartments. The sea poured in. On board the ship that night was John Harper and his much-beloved six-year-old daughter, Nana. According to documented reports, as soon as it was apparent that the ship was going to sink, John Harper immediately took his daughter to the lifeboat. It is, a reason, it is reasonable to assume that this widowed preacher could have easily gotten on the board his, this boat to safety. However, it never, seems to have crossed, it never seemed to have crossed his mind. He bent down and kissed his precious little daughter, Looking into her eyes, he told her that she, he would see her again someday. The flares going off in the dark sky above reflected the tears on his face as he turned and headed towards the crowd of desperate humanity on the sinking ocean liner. As the rear of the huge ship began to lurch upwards, it was reported that John Harper was seen making his way up to the deck yelling, Women, children, unsaved, unsaved into the lifeboats. It was only minutes later that the Titanic began to rumble deep within. Most people thought it was an explosion. Actually, the gargantuan ship was literally breaking in half. At this point, many people jumped off the decks and into the icy, dark waters below. And John Harper was one of these people. That night, 1,528 people went into the frigid waters. John Harper was seen swimming frantically to people in the water, leading them to Jesus before the hyperthermia became fatal. Mr. Harper swam up to one young man who had climbed up on a piece of debris. Reverend Harper asked him between breaths, Are you saved? The young man replied that he was not. Harper then tried to lead him to Christ, only to have the young man who was near shock, replied, no. John Harper then took off his life jacket and threw it to the man and said, here then, you need this more than I do, and swam away to other people. 
A few minutes later, Harper swam back to the young man and succeeded in leading him to salvation. Of the 1,528 people that went into the water that night, six were rescued by the lifeboats. One of them was this young man on the debris. Four years later, at a survivor's meeting, this young man stood up in tears, recounted how John Harper had led him to Christ. Mr. Harper had tried to swim back to help other people, yet because of the intense cold, had grown too weak to swim. His last words before going under in the frigid waters were, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Those were his last words. Does Hollywood remember this man? No. Oh well, no matter. This servant of God did what he had to do. While other people were trying to buy their way onto the lifeboats and selfishly trying to save their own lives, John Harper gave up his life so that others could be saved. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. John Harper was truly the hero of the Titanic. What courage, what faith, what obedience, and what love for his fellow man. John Harper, until he took his last breath, was trying to lead many uh, to Christ, as many to Christ as possible. That's a beautiful story. That's, un that's not unbelievable. It's believable. It's true. That's what the Lord asks of us, true believers. What should be more important? an unsaved person's life or a saved person's life, unsaved, until they come to know the, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, they're lost in eternity. And that's what John Harper truly believed and truly gave his life for. But you know what? We see another one in history that, uh, that was true too, nearing death, another man. And the only thing on his mind was his fellow man. Luke 23, 32 to 43. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is this Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written in it, over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justify, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Well, they were guilty. They were criminals. Jesus did nothing. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus died on the cross uh, for us. He didn't die on the cross or try to save himself. Um, John Harper, he died serving his Lord and his Savior. And so when we stop and think about what a hero really is, you know, a hero's not a a winner of a baseball game or the guy that throws a, a touchdown to win a Super Bowl uh, or win an Academy Award. That's, that's not what a hero is. Those are games. Those are rewards for earth, doing earthly, or an earthly career. <clears throat> no, the, the hero is the one who died on the cross for each and every one of us and... Um, could have saved himself, but he didn't. John Harper's faith and love for Jesus was so strong that he preached the gospel until his last breath. 
And God loved us so much that before his, before his son took his last breath, he promised eternity to a criminal on the cross. While John Harper could only share the story of salvation, Jesus Christ is the story of salvation and grant salvation to every sinner. And that's you and I, each one of us. We're all sinners. And it's up to them, up to us, whether to believe or not. John Harper was the hero of the Titanic. And Jesus Christ is the hero of the world. It's a choice we make. Uh, it, some choices are more difficult than others. My, my choice in my story was simply to listen to the advice of a wise uh, coach. Um, no sweat off my back was a game. John Harper's uh, faith and love and what he truly believed in, um, he knew he was going to give his life. But he did it anyway. And Jesus, under the persecution, uh, he was still, still had those doors open for anyone who wanted to believe. And one of those criminals is sitting with him in heaven right now because of that. So that's today's devotional. Today's devotional is about heroism, what you think a hero is. And, and you know, I ask you to think about the greatest hero. Open your Bible and think about what, uh, what the Lord's done for you and, and everybody else. And open your heart, because when you, when you do a devotional and you read it, it's a little bit different than a sermon. So it's different than a Bible study. You know, it's a devotional, and it could be anything during the day. And this, this simply was about heroes, but we always go back to who's the greatest, who's the best. Jesus, he's the greatest hero. So let's, uh, let's close. Dear Lord, thank you for these stories today, Lord. We just thank you for the uh, opportunity to share them as a devotional, to share the, the life of John Harper as a servant for you. Uh, and then, Lord, just to share uh, the time on the cross, the time that, that your son put in to, to in his last breath to be, uh, have the doors of heaven open for someone, Lord. Thank you for our salvation. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity. And Lord, there's going to be choices every single day, and there's going to be opportunities like this every single day. And I pray that hearts will be opened, ears will will be pay attention to what's being said so they can invite you into their life, Lord. Just ask you to bless the rest of this day and the rest of this week in your name. Amen. The beating of my heart is deafening, but I'm still listening in the silence after the storm. Your voice will bring me together